I'm delighted to have with me tonight here at KLOS in the studio for the first portion of our program three lovely guests. They are, in orders that you will hear their voices, Dennis Holter, Pam McCarthy, and Howard Mackey. First of all, a welcome to all of you. It's so nice to have you aboard. Um, I don't really know how to begin this. I never really do, so we might as well just all plunge into it together. Um, Dennis, what is the, the first thing uh, about uh, that that people approaching sightless or blind people usually hit upon? What's the first thing that they want to know from you or discuss with you? I think uh, they want to find out what kind of world uh, we live in as, as far as if we... just what kind of people we are. A lot of people think that uh, blind people are are sometimes people from Mars. We're, we're so different. We're not normal. And I, I think the pitch people just want to find out what kind of uh, world we do live in if it's just if it's even like theirs is it uh yes basically it's a world without physical eyesight it's a world of sensitivity it's a world where people can love one another without judging people by color or by the length of their hair it's, it's a world of uh, beauty without that physical eyesight that uh, you have what about being blind is is the most difficult? Uh, there are a lot of people that are concerned with uh, being blind. Uh, in fact, I'm sure that many sighted people out there would, would consider that the loss of sight is possibly the worst thing they could go through, but it isn't because they've still got their hearing and they've still got their touch left and they've still got their, their minds, which is probably the most important factor. Pam... What about being blind seems to you as being an advantage to people who have sight? Uh, I think the most people uh, most people say, like to me, you must be really perceptive, you know, to 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 what people feel and you know how they are, their yeah. essence, sort of, and you know, as to in contrast to like physical appearance and all that, you know, which do you see any advantages? Uh, to being blind, yeah. Uh, me, I, I'm not hampered by you know what a guy looks like or what uh, color he is or whatever. You know, I, I I've had prejudices. You know, some you know I still have prejudices, but they're not along those lines. Not along color lines. No, or not along. Even lines. though uh, I know that there is that popular Sidney Poitier concept that that sightless people, of course, could not hate a black man. But we would all know that there would be other ways of determining somebody's race by the way they speak or, you know, their their accent or the rest of it. So I would assume that there must still be ingrained prejudices among people who are sightless. Yeah, there is. Uh, and uh, I, I'm lucky. I'm really lucky because, like, my whole family background has been, you know, uh, it's just because a guy's black or red or whatever. He's no, you know, he's not low. He's no, no lower than you are. Mm-hmm. And some of the blind people I know, like, I come from the South, and uh, I come from Texas, and down there, you get a lot of that still. You know, a lot of blind kids won't talk to another black blind kid no matter what, you know, because he's black, and it's tragic. Dennis? Me. Interesting concept. Uh, from the ages of six to through ten, I went to a school called the California School for the Blind in Berkeley, mm -hmm. and uh, I was born, besides being blind, I was born with a physical defect known as cerebral palsy, which uh, limited the use of my left hand and, and left leg. I couldn't walk as fast or use my left hand as good as many other people. And the only friend I, I really had was a, a black guy. Uh, a lot of kids would call him uh, names, scareless names, and uh, they would tease me because I had something that they didn't have being cerebral palsy, and I was a scapegoat, but hmm. because the black kid was teased and so was I, we were very good friends. Howard, uh, excuse me, uh, Howard, excuse me, <laughs> so, <laughs> you should all hop in here, by the way, anytime you want, and not, not even wait for my questions, uh, there's just mm -hmm. a whole bunch of things going through my head. Howard, you're a rehabilitation counselor for blind people. What is the, the chief complaint or the most difficult thing that blind people communicate to you that you have to overcome as a, as a counselor? As a counselor, I think this would be um, orientation mobility. Orientation, orientation mobility. Orientation mobility. Know where they are uh, and how to get from, say, point A to point B 
um, this is a tremendous problem and I think probably one of the greatest problems uh, that the blind has to face. In that, in that context, um, is, it, is it a toss-up between seeing eye dogs and canes? Are there people who move around without the use of an external uh, assistance? Are there blind people who can pretty much move around on instinct? Yes, certainly. Could I kind of um, take off here just for a moment and sure. uh, kind of acquaint you with what um, blindness is? Please. Blindness um, is a legal definition which was put into effect um, in the 1935 Social Security Act, mm -hmm. which stated that a person has, say, 20 over 200 vision in the better eye. Now, what this means uh, would be you know, what the normal eye sees at 200 feet, the blind eye sees at 20 feet. Hmm. Or the other possibility being that if the field of vision is restricted so that the uh, widest diameter of uh, vision, if it subtends an angle, you know, 20 degrees or less, they might be able to read or see something at a considerable distance, but the field would be so restricted that they're considered blind. I see. And out of this group, the uh, widest diameter of uh, vision, if it subtends an angle, you know, 20 degrees or less, they might be able to read or see something at a considerable distance, but the field would be so restricted that they're considered blind. I see. And out of this group, um, as close as the, uh, well, statistically, we can determine that about, um, oh, say between 5 and 10 percent are totally without sight. 10% of, of everybody in America? 10% of the blind, of the legally blind, I see. are totally without sight. How, uh, how many people in the United States are, are legally blind, do you know? Mm -hmm. I had the figure of approximately 400,000 uh, considered uh, legally, legally blind. blind, but they're probably more than that because the state agencies don't know about everyone. Uh, as far as Pam and I are concerned, we were born with, we were born premature, so it's uh, uh. too much oxygen in, in the incubator caused our blindness, and that's renal lateral fibroplasia, so we're completely out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> completely out of sight. Huh? Yeah. Let, let's take a break here now, um, uh, Dennis, and when we come back, we're just going to open this up and, uh, and get into all kinds of aspects besides just uh, the obvious that we've been dealing with, okay? Mm -hmm. My guest tonight for the first hour of our program, Dennis Holter, Pam McCarthy, and Howard Mackey on KLOS Los Angeles. Dennis. Um, what do you see? See world through hearing. I see a lot of good in people. For every bad person there is, there's something good within each person. For every uh, person that's prejudiced, I can see a person who's, who's good. Through a world of vision, I can't go by color. So I have to establish people through what their hearts and souls, what they are through their hearts and souls, what you are. As far as external characteristics, visually, I see nothing. Colors are the only thing concept I have are like blue is the sky, green is the grass, <laughs> red is blood. About the only concepts of colors to association with other objects. Dennis, do you have any kind of uh, uh, image in your mind? Uh, you know, say like myself, do I conjure up any image uh, in your mind? Well, as a person, yes. I mean, uh, uh, I I can tell I can tell a, a little about a person a person's personality by what's revealed in their voice. Whether a person's insecure, whether a person's happy, whether a person's sad. And you can hide behind a smile or a frown, but you can never hide behind a voice very well. Nor a hand. Nor a hand. A hand? Is that what you said, Pam? Yeah. That's in intriguing. I hadn't even mm -hmm. considered that. When you shake hands with people and when you touch people's hands, this is for any of you, of course, um, what kind of insights do you get from people's hands that, that us, uh, we who are sighted, might not? It, it all depends on, on uh, well, like me, I hands are really important to me because, uh, I don't know, I look for... Uh, the way they the way they shake my hand first of all you know what are they what is it like you know if it's a firm honest 
this is nice communication to you. thing. Yeah, I, I I feel boy, you know, he's really reaching out and being nice, and and it puts me really at ease. And, and then you get the reverse that a person is uh, scared, and there are many people who are scared of blind people because blind people are, are supposedly to them so different that they run away from the unknown. Among your friends, uh, Dennis, in your personal contact, does the, does there uh, come a point where you believe the people you're communicating with go beyond the fact that you're blind? I mean, does that eventually cease to exist and cease to be an issue? I think uh, through f close friendships I've had, I think it's often forgotten. Uh, it's there, but yet it's not there. People consider not the blindness, but the person. Do you ever forget? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, especially when I'm going through uh, something that, that has to be done. Uh, I've been in broadcasting part-time for three years, and in the news business we had to keep up with deadlines. Hmm. And a deadline had to be met with either a sighted person or a blind person. <laughs> and it's one way. And I, I forget then, too, when I'm out covering news events, talking to people, not as a blind mm -hmm. person, but as a news reporter. Yeah. But you're using a lot of cues that you ordinarily, I would say that normally sighted individual does not use. Um, I would think that even to meet your deadlines and all, that this would re require more effort, more concentration oh, on your yeah, part. Yeah, in a sense. Pam, what do you dream about? What do I dream about? Uh, varied things. I mean, I, I dream, I think, I <laughs> that's, that's really <laughs> getting into something there. Are your dreams conceptual? I mean, obviously they couldn't, they couldn't be visual. Uh, so, in other words, when, when most of us dream, we dream and we see like movies going on in our head. <laughs> but you've never seen a movie, so I'm, I'm curious. Well, I see 3D, <laughs> stereo yeah. vision, technicolor. I don't know. I don't exactly. Uh, let's see. Uh, when I dream, uh, I just see images, uh, three-dimensional images, and feel certain textures and hear certain sounds. In other words, your dreams are... Uh, I don't understand what you mean by seeing three-dimensional objects. Well, like, if... Uh, I, mean we s I see a person as as a person. I see, uh, you know, not a two-dimensional thing. Like, on a f isn't a film screen, like, two-dimensional, right? No, no. It isn't? A, oh, a film, a film screen, screen is three-dimensional. A film screen is, li is just like a wall, as you would be touching mm -hmm. it, with an image projected yeah, on right. it. So it would be just one-dimensional. Okay, well, okay, when I see, I see a person... Exactly as it is, as I, exactly as he is. My hand is, you know, exactly the way it is when uh, the whole thing is there, not That's just determined the... Determined through feel, is this what you're saying? Uh, you yeah. Feel? Uh, for, yeah, my, my, my main senses are, are hearing and, and mm -hmm. feeling and, and emotion and... So, you're, so your dreams are representations of what you, you're just describing now? Right. Dennis, same with you? A friend of mine is involved in doing a survey for his master's thesis in psych on uh, the dreams of the congenitally blind, that means the dreams of those persons who were born blind. Ah, fantastic. And uh, he yes. goes into things like, uh, have you ever dreamed about an event before it happened? Uh, have you ever had any erotic dreams? Just the regular things. I see uh, in my dreams there are people talking, strange sounds, weird sounds, there's oh, often right. music, there's touch, there's <laughs> almost everything you can think of but vision. I dream, I dream about driving. <laughs> driving? Yeah. Driving I dreamed <laughs> yeah, Well, um, strangely, I, I don't know. Uh, I had a really odd one about oh. driving a van up a mountain, and <laughs> and uh, we just went. I just went really slow, and you hear, you hear, uh, a distance. You can hear a, an echo, a distance, and and how far you are from, from mm -hmm. the center of a road. If you, I can, sometimes, and it was an odd thing. <laughs> We'll be right back. Pam had uh, recalled a dream that she wanted to share with us, and then there were a couple of other things I wanted us to talk about. But please, go right ahead, Pam. Sure. Okay. Uh, my dream started out. It was a war dream. And it uh, started out where I was in what I conceived to be Vietnam. And the scenery was, uh, you know, it was warm, and there was rice fields all around us, and it was muddy and things. And then we were living at... Uh, one of the headquarters in the house we lived in had a big glass window and uh, my parents and I uh, were harboring two spies <laughs> and, and these two spies were uh, were being sought by the 
by the North Vietnamese. And the, we had a, they had a gun emplacement placed about, oh, I don't know, 600 or so yards away from us. And so every time the spies would reveal themselves through the window, they, we, they would fire. You know, they would shoot machine guns at us. And, and we'd have to come back it down into our, to uh, the floor. You know, we'd have to hit mm -hmm. the ground. Mm -hmm. But the most, I think the most terrifying part of that dream I remember is uh, my grandmother and my little sister were there, and they got in the way. And they both got wounded. Oh. And the the thing I can remember is uh, that I was the only one there, and I had to, to you know, do what I could. And um, I remember the feel, how the blood was, you know. The feel of the blood. The feel of the blood and the smell of the iron warm, in the blood. Mm -hmm. well, you know, yeah. warm and, and sticky. Sticky, and, sticky. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the, the smell of the iron in the blood and, and the mm. way the, the flesh felt, you know, when uh -huh. I had to... It was it was really what, detailed. What's extraordinary to me, uh, among every, uh, so many other things, but as you were describing that, it occurred to me that when I dream, uh, as far as I can recollect right now, I can't recall ever smelling anything in my dream. I mean, I never can recall a smell. I wonder if our, any any of the gang listening can remember that. Dennis, w uh, I want to get into touch now. Um, <laughs> you gave me an extraordinary gift 20 minutes ago or a half hour ago when you came into the building, and uh, just to describe it to everybody... This is a copy of Playboy magazine in Braille. <laughs> the entire magazine in Braille. Per six of us make up the entire magazine. Six books make up one. Oh, yeah. It's no, three of, oh, see, three of them. Before it was censored. See, they censor it. The government does. And now, now it is three parts, but it used to be six. And, and just for the benefit of the listeners, this is just the r written part of Playboy. The, the, the young ladies are not revealed to us in Braille, even though it, <laughs> it would seem to me that they could be, couldn't Well, yes, we were looking for volunteers. You couldn't <laughs> do us justice. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about Braille. Let's talk about uh, reading Braille. I, I've just opened any page here at random, and I'm running my fingers over it. Uh, Pam, would you like to put your hand out? Okay, um... The, the whole, the As a matter of fact, let me open to any page, and okay. I, I would just be curious. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. No, not at all. Here, um, put that in your lap. Let me see if it's something that I can... Isn't it incredible? Instinctively, as I gave Pan the book, I was turning to turn the light on next to her. Which <laughs> <laughs> One of the other advantages this? of reading uh, on the blind, you can read in the dark. <laughs> My mother used to get really mad at me because... Time to go to bed, Dennis, and I'd say, okay. And <laughs> well, that's I'd the be reading there, you know, at <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning, and she'd find me reading, and, you know. That's, that's the main problem I have. When someone comes over to my house and he's sighted, I bring him up in my room, and we're talking, and all of a sudden my mother comes up and says, Pam, the light isn't on. <laughs> 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 and all this time, well, this is page 341, folks. Read a little to it. And it says, uh, why they got so all fired upset over that, that they had old Judge... Uh, Old Judge Pickens draw up a restraining order. This is a lot of dialect on Crazy John. <laughs> it's a, let, let me stop you there, n anticipating what might be in a Playboy article coming <laughs> to the, the radio. As as Pam is running her fingers over the page, it's one one. What are you doing? I mean, you, so many intricate movements are going on. You're using both of your hands. Well, aren't okay, now this hand is my reading hand. My right hand is my reading hand. Your right hand is your and, reading hand. And uh, I use the first finger on my right hand and sometimes a second finger right. but it gets confusing <laughs> uh, and my left hand is is while I'm going across the page with my right hand my left hand is finding the next line ah I see so I come back there and I I know what the next line is that's one way of doing it uh, I am a militant I read with one finger and I've been threatening to insure my finger because if I cut that finger, I can't read right. Yeah, well, I can do that too, but, but the, th the thing is, is uh, you know, I'm doing it right now. What you're yeah. feeling, are they actually the shape of letters in dots, or is there a, a code, uh, well, a dot representing right A? Right here, right now, there's two, there's, I think there's five, four or five grades of Braille. And this, the standard Three. thing, oh, well, I know, but there's, I think there's scientific notation now, and numbers notation mm -hmm. now. And that constitutes two more grades or one. And um, this is grade two. This is a standard magazine, grade two Braille. Here's grade, a grade two Braille is p a picture, if you will. Uh, grade one is, is all the letters the written alphabet. out. Is all the letters written out. Right. right. Grade two is like your shorthand. If you, you take shorthand, me, we have various signs. There are ER signs and AR signs and ATION signs and that. Okay, well, here's a grade two. Whether this is right, this is the word right. And instead of being just R I G H T, it's it's got, it's what we call a dot five before an R, and that's it shortens it. And this is let me see what it, what is this? I'm reading upside down. 
Uh, can't read that. Uh, going over that, there's about 64 different combinations on the grade two, which they can use, and each one of these stand for um, letters or groups of letters, uh, as Pam was telling you here, you know, like A-T-I-O-N or uh, E-D or I common. See. This is really um, a lot of dialect, wow. Letters, so that you, it's a form of shorthand. Let me, let me oh, here's first. couldn't. Here's, here's a good one. Let, let me take the book okay. out of your hand for a moment so you can be more comfortable by the microphone. Just describing this uh, to the people who are listening, if you've never seen Braille, it's uh, this issue of Playboy, which is the <laughs> December 1970 issue, by the way, part three. It's just a series of white pages, the book being, the magazine being twice as large, the Braille copy, as the uh, regular copy in terms of its physical space. And to look at the, the page, is just a combination of dots uh, and inverted dots. In other words, some of them pop up at you and some of them recede into the page. Oh, I know why you, you look at... Th that's an interesting thing because turn or the page over and it's written on both sides. And it's the holes, oh, I, I the holes on, on that one side uh, that are receding constitute the dots on the other side of the page. I was wrong in my description of this magazine. In the front of the magazine, uh, <laughs> the front is an alphabet uh, like that I made for you on, and the last line of the alphabet is your name. Oh, so really? Even, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm so touching. You have Elliot in Braille. <laughs> uh, uh, now, yeah. but I wouldn't be feeling the ri the E rising. Uh, no, most sighted yeah. people would, would read Braille with their eyes. Most sighted people do read Braille with their eyes. Yeah, they or cheat. Or, yeah. the, or, the, or the, you read Braille with the exact tip of your finger. Those of you who play well, the guitar, it's, it's where you, you hit the string. You, you play with your left hand, hit the string, with the very tip of your, of your finger. And, and a lot of sighted people I know, instead of reading with this tip, right next to your fingernail, almost, read with the wider tip, you know, just uh, up until the first knuckle. And they can't, they cover about three lines at once, and <laughs> they get mixed up. I think we might describe here, you know, to the uh, listeners, just what forms a Braille cell. This is formed of two uh, parallel rows in the Braille cell, and there's three, um, possibly, say, three dots in each row. And this is what we're talking about when we uh, say an A will uh, stands for, say, a dot one, and an E is a dot one and five, and a series, a series of these dots uh, is what Pam is talking about in reading. I it see. takes good mm -hmm. discrimination to be able to do this and a lot of practice. Dennis, how, f how fast can you read in Braille, an average well, size book? It, it, it varies. Uh, I can go 350, 400 a minute. Uh, 350 words per minute? Yeah. This is he really can. Unusual. <laughs> it's uh, genius. I'm <laughs> fairly fast at it because I love to read Braille. I mean, I like it better than I like to read books on tape. Tape readers are too slow. I can skim Braille, but I can't skim tape readers. <laughs> there are plenty of books on tape written yeah. by, uh, read by old, old ladies who sound like they're at least 900 years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell, me, tell me this, Dan. Uh, what about listening to music? I mean, the, the logical oh. assumption would be that you folks, if you forgive that, that setting you apart from me, but that, that people who are sightless um, would be able to appreciate more in a symphonic piece or any piece than somebody with sight. Is that just all hokum, or is there truth to that? Part, yeah, I would think that uh, because the sense of hearing is, has been more developed, the blind person could uh, inc uh, increase his capacity to ap appreciate something. However, when you get into a loud psychedelic music, I know that if someone's turning a record player very, very high, my hearing being what it is, I don't like the music because it's too loud. Uh, we're very, very conscious of, of hearing. If something's too loud, uh, it's hard for me to concentrate if there's loud noise in a room. How? You know? I sort of disagree. I disagree, Pam? too. Okay, uh, Pam and then Howard. Okay, um, I think that it doesn't necessarily make any difference when you listen to a piece, whether you're blind or whether you're sighted. I know that, I know sighted people that can still tell better than I, you know, what an al what, what a bal the balance of the album is, you know, the, and here, I, I might be able to hear more in the way of, of being able to discriminate between the instruments, but as far as, uh, as uh, the whole thing is concerned in production, I still know sighted people that are more adept than I am. How, Howard, you had a comment? I think so. That uh, what I'm, uh, I think what Dennis, uh, I would have to disagree with him is that in this respect, that we all are born with a certain capacity to hear. And uh, even though we say go blind like I have, this sense of hearing is not increased. I had to use it more, and I might have, you know, for information purposes. But by and large, the blind uh, as a group 
have more hearing problems than the normal population. Hmm. I, I did not know that. Yeah, this is true. I can see where it would be true because of the the cells of the of the brain and all that would be used so much more that they would wear out. Dennis, and degenerate. Excuse me. Yeah. What about animals? What about touching and playing with animals? <laughs> I bet that must um, be extraordinary. Well, they're neat. <laughs> it is. I think Pam could answer it better than I. I because I'm not an animal freak. <laughs> I'm a people freak. You know, okay. like I get people high people's animals. vibrations. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean. Pam, what about touching animals and horses and oh, dogs? Oh, you just hit it. <laughs> horses. Um, they're my favorite too. They are. It's extraordinary. I mean, it really. Uh, the only the only thing I can say about it is it's it's. Uh, I've had good luck with, with horses. They like me. Uh, Do you touch their noses and their tongues? And all yeah, that? and uh, I, I I try to to tell them I love them, you know, through, with my hands, and what it do works. What you do when a uh, dog, say, if you're walking down the street and a dog comes hurtling out of a yard, you know, and it sounds like he's just going to tear a leg off of you? Well, uh, if I'm on the street, I know I run, and if I'm on the street, I don't know. I try and be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> I stop and say, hey, man, you know. <laughs> cool that, okay. Crowley. Yeah. <laughs> you can do that with almost every breed of dog. Of course, Doberman Pinchers don't respond to that kind of uh, feeling, I don't think. And TLC, they don't do Right. <laughs> TLC? Tender loving care. Ah. <laughs> Dennis, what about touching people? When you touch <laughs> people, do you... Well, tell us what happens. Can often, when I touch a person, I... A, I get some kind of description of how tall they are, how much they weigh, or also what kind of vibrations <laughs> are going through them, what kind of feelings they're having, whether they're insecure, whether they're shaky, whether they're just happy and go lucky, you know, this, you know, it's really neat. Can you make that determination just from touching hands, or are you talking about uh, other parts well, of the body? Uh, hands uh, or other parts of the body, too. Uh, the shoulder. Uh, Elbows, especially. Uh, An elbow, too. Yeah, elbows? Mm -hmm. Yes, because, elbow. you see, when a blind person walks with a sighted person, uh, he walks behind the sighted person with, he puts his hand on the sighted person's elbow. That way, the sighted person walks a step in front of him, so... I see. Or a half mm -hmm. step. Yeah, or that. Half step, whatever. Uh, just, at a curio uh, just for the purposes of experimentation, could I just lean over and could you touch my elbow and see... Uh, uh, first, Dennis, and then Pam can do it. You both lean. Let me just turn the microphone around. There. I'd be interesting, interested what reading, if any, you get from that. It's a, it's a strong uh, elbow. You seem like you'd be <laughs> athletically inclined during your high school or well, previously in your life. Pam, want to do some elbow touching? Okay. Uh, hmm. You're not, uh, you're not tense. And you are a little bit, you're not. And, uh, and, uh, I think that, like, we're just having a good time. Pam, I think I'm falling in love with you, but keep touching that elbow like that. <laughs> 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 we're here with uh, Dennis, Pam, and Howard, and in just a few moments we'll be joined by John and Yoko.